Hello again, everyone. It is time once again for Scripture Verse by Verse Radio. My name is Michael Moret. Today we're in the book of Romans, continuing our verse by verse study through the whole Bible from Genesis through Revelation. We come to Romans chapter 11, verse 11. So grab your Bible if you can, open it up to Romans chapter 11, and we'll begin in just a minute. I want to remind you, as I always do, about the Scripture Verse by Verse website. And the reason I do this is because I love God's Word. And I know that it's the most important thing on this planet. And that's the truth, because God says that He exalts His Word even above His own name. That's how important it is. And so it is vital for us to study the Word of God as Christians. Because that's how we get closer to Jesus. That's how our faith increases. And that sanctifies us too, which is why Jesus prayed, and I prayed before every message, and I'll pray right now, Lord, in advance of our study today, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Study the whole word of God from Genesis to Revelation at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. Now, Romans chapter 11, verse 11. Paul says, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I say then, have they, the they being the Jewish people, the Hebrews, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. You know, no one is beyond recovery unless they're burning in hell. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? In other words, there's no chance of them being reversed, of coming to Christ, simply because they have rejected him thus far. God forbid. And that's so true. And not just with the Jews, which is what he's talking about here, but with you, with somebody that you know. No one is beyond recovery unless they're burning in hell. And that is because God is the God of the second chance and the third chance and the fourth chance and the fifth chance and on and on it goes. If a person wants to repent and wants to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior, they can do that. And they can do that until such time as they are burning in hell. And it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. It's not too late as long as you're alive. And so 11 says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So God turned to the entire world and offered everyone salvation when it was clear that after giving the Jews the first shot at it, They rejected Christ. Israel's Israel's rejection of Jesus Christ, therefore, meant good things for the rest of the world, in a sense. And here God is saying, just wait till you see how I'm going to bless the world when Israel finally comes to their senses and they receive Christ. Amen. If it was good, if good things happened to the world in the sense of people getting saved, when, when my Old Testament people rejected Christ, just think how many good things are going to happen when they finally receive Christ. Well, you didn't set aside the Hebrews. Not at all. As I said last time, Paul himself was a Hebrew. The early church was made up of Hebrews, Israelites. Verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my office. Whatever Paul did for Jesus, 
he did with all of his heart. He worked as hard as he possibly could. He magnified his ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. He worked as hard as he possibly could to see souls saved. He preached as hard as he possibly could preach. He didn't hold back anything. He did it for as long as he could and to as many people as he could. And so look at 13 and 14. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my office that by any means I may provoke to emulation those who are my flesh and might save some of them. See, it broke the Apostle Paul's heart to see so many of his fellow Hebrews die without Jesus because he knew they went to hell. And he preached the word of God to the Gentiles because Jesus commanded him to. But he also preached the word of God to the Gentiles so that whoever was interested could be saved. And he also preached to the Gentiles because he hoped that the Jews would see the peace and the joy of those Gentile Christians and would want what they had through Jesus Christ. And that's why it's so important if you are a Christian to be completely sold out to Jesus Christ, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love the Word of God, to have great fellowship with Jesus, to have the joy of the Lord, to have peace in your life. Because you see, today hell-bound sinners will not know that Jesus is real unless we Christians put Christ first. If we don't put Jesus first and we don't make holiness a priority, then we are not going to have joy and we are not going to have peace. And if we don't have that, then we're not going to influence anyone in the direction of Christ. And if they don't come to Christ, then they're going to burn in hell forever. You see why it's so important for you and I as Christians to live for Christ, to be very close to him, to not have any unconfessed sins in our life? You can't be salt and light to the rest of the world. You can't show them the way. You can't make them thirsty for God unless you are living holy as a Christian. You can't. And you're useless. You're like saltless salt. Unsalty salt, like Jesus said, it's good for nothing. Throw it away. Throw it in the garbage. Verse 15. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? In other words, if God used Israel's sin of rejecting Jesus Christ to bring about good, then just imagine what God will do when they finally repent. 16. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump, the whole lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree were to graft it in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, Stop there for a second. Think of God's salvation as being a tree, okay? If you can imagine it in your mind, God's salvation is a salvation tree. And saved people are branches in God's salvation tree. And some of the Jewish branches were broken off. And they were replaced with Gentile branches. Verse 17 and 18. And if some of the branches were broken off, or be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, 
Thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. In other words, Gentile Christians should never look down upon the Jewish race. Even the Hebrews who have rejected Christ. Not any more than anybody else. I mean, because we're all saved by grace. Say, but never look down upon the Jewish race. No Christian should ever be an anti-Semite. Because their ancient relationship with God is the root of that salvation tree that you now are in. Without them, there would be no root to that salvation tree. It never would have taken off. It never would have grown. There would be no salvation tree for Gentiles or anyone else if it wasn't for the Jewish roots which fed that tree. After all, the most important reason is Jesus Christ himself, the Savior, is Jewish. 19. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Thou sayest well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not haughty, but fear. The Jews who were pulled out of the salvation tree were pulled out because they refused to put their faith in Christ. The Gentiles who are put into that tree are there because of their faith in Christ. Faith in Christ puts one in and rejecting that faith in Christ pulls one out. Like I said, I think last time, everything rises and falls on what you do with Jesus. Your religion doesn't matter. The church you go to doesn't matter. Not, not what we're talking about here. The essence of salvation does not depend on which church you go to, whether it's a building or a house or you meet outside someplace. The essence of salvation depends on what you do with Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ is the only thing that can save a person, and not having faith in Jesus Christ is the big sin that condemns a person. Verse 21. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also not spare thee. In other words, don't think you're special. He's warning Gentile Christians who might become haughty and feel superior over, over the Hebrews. And God says, don't think you're special because you're in the salvation tree. And whatever you do, don't become arrogant about being saved, thinking that you are special, and that's why Jesus saved you. Don't go down that road. That's the mistake that the Jews made in the first place. They were arrogant. They began thinking that they were saved because they were better than others. Their arrogance eventually led to the destruction of their faith because they said, faith, what do I need faith for? I'm better than others. I got Hebrew blood flowing through my vein. My father is Abraham. I've got the true religion, which is true. I've got the scripture. Yes, you do. They became bit puffed up with pride over what they had and who they were. They didn't, have, they didn't have faith. They were relying on all these other things. Their arrogance eventually led to the destruction of whatever faith they had, and it will destroy the faith of any Gentiles who go so far as to stop trusting Christ and instead depend on their own goodness. Verse 22. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward thee goodness if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. God is stern toward those who reject his son, even if they at one time followed him. This is going to disrupt some of your theology with some of you people. I know it is. I know it is. But take heart. I know where you're coming from because I was there, okay? For many, many years, I was there because of the school that I went to. I was there. I love systematic theology. I studied it on my own as well as taking several semesters of it. My degree is in theology. I love theology. 
I understand it. And I understand where some of you people are coming from. But let's read verse 22 again. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward thee goodness. If. If thou continue. In his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be what? Cut off. It doesn't say. Otherwise, you will not be grafted in in the first place. Not really. You'll just think that you were. No, it says you will be cut off. They were in. God is stern toward those who reject his son, even if they at one time followed him. Whatever we used to be doesn't count. Do you know that? What we are now is what matters to God. If we are not following Christ and trusting in him now, then God will not have mercy on us. It doesn't matter what we used to do. God is kind toward those who trust his son. God will not give us what our sins deserve if Jesus is our Lord and Savior. He will give us heaven instead of hell if Jesus is our Lord and Savior. But that promise comes with a warning and a condition, which is don't quit on Jesus. Keep trusting in him for salvation, because if you quit on him, you will be pulled out of that salvation tree. That's crystal clear. If that doesn't line up with your theology, your theology is wrong. You say, well, my, my pastor has talked about this verse, but he just calls it a problem verse. It's not a problem verse. It's so crystal clear, it doesn't even need to be interpreted. The only people who want to interpret this verse are those who want to explain the plain truth of it away. Verse 23. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted in contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which are the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Kind of confusing. Let me summarize it for you. Salvation is not, is not about being good enough or doing this or that good work. Salvation is about faith in Christ. God says it again right here. If a person doesn't persist in unbelief toward Christ, they will be put into that salvation tree. You can have faith, you're saved. If you lose your faith, you're not saved. You can, if you have faith again, you're saved. It all depends on salvation. It all depends on your faith. We're saved by faith, period. I mean, it's the plain truth of Scripture right here. Verse 25. For I, brethren, would not have you to be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Jesus knows exactly how many non-Jewish people will receive him as Lord and Savior. And when that last one gets saved, when that last non-Jewish person gets saved at some point in history, an amazing thing is going to happen. The hearts of a multitude of Hebrews will be softened at that moment. They'll be softened toward the Lord Jesus Christ and many of them will receive him. 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away the ungodliness, turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Verse 27. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. <clears throat> every Israelite, in other words, every Israelite who is destined to be saved shall be saved. This doesn't mean that every person who has Hebrew blood flowing through their veins will eventually come to Christ or be saved. It doesn't mean that when it says all Israel will be saved. <coughs> it simply means that everyone who wants to be saved and turns to Christ will be saved. 28. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, and they certainly were back in that first century anyway. The Jews were the big en enemies of the early church. You know, the first major persecution of Christianity came from the Jews, not the Romans. 
And so it says, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Meaning this, in spite of all the bad, in spite of all the bad and the rejecting the Christ, and we have no king but Caesar, and away with him, crucify him, in spite of all the bad, God did not slam the door shut on all Hebrews just because some of them really messed up. See, God promised Abraham centuries earlier. He promised Abraham, the ancestor of the Jewish race, that he would not reject them. And God's word is true, which is why the Israelites have remained as the people of God. I should not say that. Which is why God's promise is true. He doesn't go back on his word, which is why the Israelites have remained a distinct people for thousands of years in spite of being hated, hunted, and threatened with extinction by many. It's because God said, he promised Abraham, that there would always be Hebrews who would be his people. And there always has been. Verse 29. For the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. This is a wonderful verse, isn't it? God called the Jews to be his people, and he will make sure that at least some of them will always be around to answer that call. God does not go back on his promises. He does not go back on his gifts or his callings. People can refuse God's gifts. Or they can say they don't want them anymore. They can refuse his calling. They can say, I'm not going to use it anymore. I'm not going to preach anymore. I'm not going to teach anymore. I'm not going to give anymore. I'm not going to whatever. But God will never remove them from them. They can let them go dormant, but God's not going to take them away. And you can always repent, you know. Verse 30. For as in times past, ye have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. God offered salvation to Gentiles because the Jews didn't want it. God loves to bless. He just does. It's his nature to bless, you know. So if one person doesn't want it, he'll find someone else who does. He will not rob himself of the joy that he receives from blessing. If you don't want God's blessings, he'll find somebody who does. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, the Bible says, looking for someone that he can show himself strong to. Verse 31. Even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. God showed and continues to show mercy to the Gentiles and he also shows mercy to the Jews. The Jews and Gentiles, they're, they, they are both in the kingdom of God today, whoever repents and receives Christ. None of us are worthy of forgiveness. None of us are worthy of eternal life. It's only through the mercy of God that any of us are saved. And we can only be saved when we know that our only hope is God's mercy, and that only comes through Christ. 32, for God hath enclosed them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. We are all disobedient sinners. That's what it means. God has enclosed us all in unbelief. He has stated that we are all, we are all condemned. God has enclosed them all in unbelief that he might have mercy on all. We are all disobedient sinners. But God wants to show mercy in spite of our unworthiness. And actually, our unworthiness is what makes his mercy, mercy. We all need it. And every one of us can have it if we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. The best way to go through life is to obey God and to confess when we fail and to trust that he knows what he's doing. That's the best way to go through life, to obey God, to confess when we fail, and to trust that God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. 
And God knows what is best for us in the long run, even if we can't figure him out, and of course we cannot. But the best way to go through life is to trust that he knows what he's doing, and he's smarter than us. So again, verse 33, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways past finding out. We don't know what God is thinking. We don't understand the mind of God. We can't figure out God's ways or what he is doing or how he is doing it. And you know, it doesn't pay for us to ask why when we don't understand something. It doesn't pay for us to ask why. God, number one, never tells us to ask why or to pursue the why. And it doesn't pay to ask why because God probably won't tell us anyway. And even if he did, chances are we wouldn't be able to grasp it. Don't ask why. Why are things like this, God? Instead of asking why, ask what. What do you want me to do? And ask how. How should I behave? See, that's where our focus should be. Don't worry about the why, because the why is God's business. Our business is obedience, in spite of not knowing the why. See, keep that focus, and you'll be okay. 34, for who hath known the mind of the Lord, who, who, who hath been his counselor? Well, the answer is no one. God doesn't need counsel. No one should ever try to tell God what to do. And no one should complain about how things are. God doesn't need correcting. He doesn't need you to second guess what he has allowed or what he is doing because he's always correct. No one should say, God, God, would you like a little sage advice? You don't even, you shouldn't even think in those terms. He doesn't want it, nor does he need it. Verse 35. Or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again. You know, you know that God doesn't owe you anything. You do know that, don't you? God doesn't owe anyone anything. Because anything good that we enjoy is a product of God's goodness and mercy. He doesn't owe it to us. God is not in debt to anyone. Because if it wasn't for him, no one would even be able to take a breath. If it wasn't for him, every single human being that is born would immediately die because of their sin and then go to hell and burn them forever. God doesn't owe anyone anything ever. You have no right to be angry at God. You have no right to challenge God. Why would you be upset with God? He owes you nothing. See, if you rightly understand what you really deserve as a sinner, you'll never be angry at God again, ever. 36, for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. God doesn't owe us anything, but we owe him everything. We would not have been born if it wasn't for God. And anything good that we have ever experienced since birth is a gift from God. We owe God many thank yous. Most of all, for eternal life through Jesus Christ if we have received Jesus as Lord and Savior. Out of time. Continue studying the Word of God. We're out of time here. I know that, but you can continue studying right now. Go to the Scripture Verse by Verse website found at thebibleversebyverse.com and begin a systematic study through the entire Bible. That's my suggestion. Begin in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, but you can start wherever you want. It's up to you. Click on the book you want to study. Click on the chapter. Open your Bible, listen, and follow along. And remember, please, that I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination, but I depend on you, individual Christians, who love the Word of God to support this ministry. And you can give in a secure method at thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click on the Donate button at the top of the front page and give as the Lord may lead, or write Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin, 53074. That's Scripture Verse by Verse. Post Office Box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin, 53074.
seven four. So long.